Hello everyone, I am Saloni Aroda and today we will discuss chapter 9 of class 12 psychology textbook that is developing psychological skills. Today we will discuss the second part which covers psychological testing skills, interviewing skills and counselling skills and ethics in counselling. So let's first start with psychological testing skills. The next set of competencies which psychologists require is concerned with the knowledge base of the discipline of psychology. They involve psychological assessment, evaluation and problem solving with individuals and groups, organization and the community. Psychological tests are primarily used for the determination and analysis of individual differences in general intelligence, differential aptitudes, educational achievement, vocational fitness, personality, social attitudes and various non-intellectual characteristics. While using psychological test, an attitude of objectivity, scientific orientation and standardized interpretation must be kept in mind. For example, in organizational and personnel work, in business and industry, where specialized tests are used to select individuals for specific jobs, it is essential to use actual performance records or ratings as a criterion for establishing validity of a test. Suppose the personnel department wants to know whether a certain psychological test can help to identify potentially best stenographers. It must be established that the test differentiates among employees of several performance levels. In addition, it should be found that the performance on the job of a newly employed worker selected on the basis of a test indeed matches with his or her test scores. So we have covered the concept of psychological testing skills. Now let's move to the concept of interviewing skills. An interview is a purposeful conversation between two or more people that follows a basic question and answer format. Interviewing is more formal than most other conversations because it has a preset purpose and uses a focus structure. There are many kind of interviews. The employment interview is one which most of you are likely to face. Some other formats are information gathering interview, counseling interview, interrogatory interview, radio television interview and research interview. But what is an interview format? Once the objectives of interview are established, the interviewer prepares an interview format. The basic format, regardless of the interview's purpose, is divided into three stages, namely opening, the body and the closing. We would now discuss these three stages briefly. The first stage is opening of the interview. The opening of interview involves establishing rapport between two communicators. The purpose is to make the interviewee comfortable. Generally, the interviewer starts the conversation and does most of the talking at the outset. This serves two functions. Firstly, it establishes the goal of interview and gives the interview time to become comfortable with the situation and the interviewer. The next stage is body of the interview. The body of the interview is the heart of the process. In this stage, the interviewer asks questions in an attempt to generate information and data that are required for the purpose. The body of the interview also involves sequencing of questions. To accomplish the purpose of an interview, the interviewer prepares a set of questions, also called a schedule, for different domains or categories he or she wants to cover. To do this, the interviewer must first decide on the domains or categories under which information is to be generated. For example, 
in the questions used in job interview, the interviewer selected several categories such as nature of the organization last worked for, satisfaction with the past job, views on product and etc. These categories and the questions within them are framed ranging from easy to answer to difficult to answer. Questions are also formulated to assess facts as well as subjective assessment. But what are the types of interview questions? The first type is direct question. They are explicit and require specific information. For example, where did you last work? The second kind of question is open-ended question. They are less direct and specify only the topic. For example, how happy were you with your job on the whole? The next type is close-ended question. They provide response alternatives narrowing the response variations. For example, do you think knowledge of a product or communication skill is more important for a salesperson? The next type is bipolar question. It is a form of close-ended question. It requires a yes or a no response. For example, would you like to work for the company? The next set is leading question. It encourages a response in favor of a specific answer. For example, wouldn't you say yes, you are in favor of having officers union in the company? The next type of question is mirror question. They are intended to get a person to reflect on what she or he had said and expand on it. For example, you said, I work so hard but I am unable to get success. Please explain as to why this happens. So this was under different types of questions. The next stage is closing the interview. While closing the interview, the interviewer should summarize what he or she has been able to gather. One should end with a discussion of the next step to be taken. When the interview is ending, the interviewer should give a chance to the interviewee to ask questions or offer comments. The next set of skills are counseling skills. Another prerequisite for developing as a psychologist is the competence in the domain of counseling and guidance. In order to develop these competencies, psychologists must undergo proper training and education under guided supervision. Counseling is also one such domain where a person entering the field is required to engage in self-introspection in order to assess his or her inclination and basic skill set for being effective in his or her vocation. But what is counseling? Let's first start with the meaning and nature of counseling. Counseling provides a system for planning the interview, analyzing the counselor and client's behavior, and determining the developmental impact on the client. So in this section today, we will discuss the skills, concepts, and methods that are designed to help develop concrete competencies. A counselor is most often interested in building an understanding of the client's problem by focusing on what understanding the client has of his or her problem and how he or she feels about it. The actual or objective facts of the problem are considered less important and it is considered more important to work on the feelings and their acknowledgement by the clients. The focus is more on the person and how he or she defines the problem. Therefore, counseling involves helping relationship that includes someone seeking help and someone willing to give help who is capable of or trained to help in a setting that permits help to be given and received. The following elements about counseling are common to the major theoretical approaches to counseling. Counseling involves responding to the feelings, thoughts and actions of the client. Counseling involves basic acceptance of the client's perceptions and feelings without using 
any evaluative standards. Confidentiality and privacy constitute essential ingredients in the counselling setting. Physical facilities that preserve this quality are very important. Counselling is also voluntary. It takes place when a client approaches a counsellor. A counsellor never uses any kind of coercion for obtaining information. Counsellors and clients both transmit and receive verbal and non-verbal messages during the process. Therefore, awareness and sensitivity to the nature of the message is an important prerequisite for a counsellor's effectiveness. But what is developing effective relationships? And why is it important as a counselling skill? For most people who seek help from a counsellor, effective or satisfying relationships are almost non-existent or infrequent. Since change in behaviour is often created and supported by a network of social support, it is essential for clients to start developing more positive relationships with other persons. The counselling relationship is the initial vehicle through which this begins. Like all of us, counsellors too are not perfect, but they are trained in developing a more healthy and helpful relationship than others. In brief, counselling usually has an all-inclusive outcome for the clients. Effective behavioural change that takes place in the client is multifaceted. It may show up in the form of a client taking greater responsibility, developing new insight, learning to engage in different behaviours and making an effort to develop more effective relationships. Let's discuss what are the characteristics of effective helper. Being a trained helper, the counsellor has the responsibility for ensuring that his or her clients is benefited from counselling and its therapeutic effects are achieved. To a large extent, however, the success of a counselling process depends on the skill, knowledge, attitude, personal qualities and behaviour of a counsellor, any or all of which can enhance or diminish the helping process. In this section, we will discuss four qualities that are associated with effective counsellors. These include authenticity, positive regard for others, ability to empathise and paraphrasing. So the first characteristic of effective helper is authenticity. Your image or perception of yourself makes up your I. The self-perceived I is revealed through ideas, words, actions, clothing and your lifestyle. All of these communicate your I to others. Those who come into close contact with you also build their own way of you for themselves and they also sometimes communicate this image to you. For example, friends tell you what they like and dislike about you. Your teachers and parents praise or criticize you. You are also evaluated by persons you respect. These collective judgments by people you respect are called significant others, which develop into a me. This other perceived me is the person that others perceive you to be. This perception may be the same as or different from your own self-perception of I. The degree to which you are aware of these perceptions of others as well of your own perceptions of yourself indicates that you are self-aware. Authenticity means that your behavioural expressions are consistent with what you value and the way you feel and relate to your inner self-image. The next characteristic is positive regard for others. In a counselling-counsellor relationship, a good relationship allows freedom of expression. It reflects acceptance of the idea that the feelings of both are important. We should remember that when we form a new relationship, 
we experience feelings of uncertainty and anxiety. Such feelings get minimized when a counselor extends a positive regard to the client by accepting that it is all of right to feel the way the client is feeling. In order to show positive regard to others, the following guidelines may be kept in mind. The first is, when you are speaking, get into the habit of using I messages rather than you messages. An example of this would be, I understand rather than you should not. The next is, respond to what the other person has said after checking with him or her. The next is, Give the other person the freedom to share feelings or anything he or she wants to say. Do not interrupt or cut in. Do not assume that the other person knows what you are thinking. Express yourself according to the frame of reference, that is, in the context of the verbal exchange taking place. Do not label either yourself or the other person. For example, you are an introvert. The next characteristic is empathy. This is one of the most critical competencies that a counsellor needs to have. Empathy is the ability of a counsellor to understand the feelings of another person from his or her perspective. It is like stepping into someone else's shoes and trying to understand the pain and troubled feelings of the other person. But there is a difference between sympathy and empathy. In sympathy, you play the saviour. You may think that someone deserves your kindness. The last characteristic of effective helper is paraphrasing. This skill has already been discussed in the section we have covered on communication skills earlier. You will recall that this involves the ability of a counsellor to reflect on what the client says and feels using different words. So, we have covered three types of skills today. Psychological testing skills, interviewing skills and counselling skills. Let's move to the next concept of ethics of counselling. In recent years, counsellors have taken important steps to develop their professional identity. A critical criterion for any professional group is the development and implementation of appropriate ethical standards. Social workers, marriage counsellors, family therapists and psychologists all have their ethical codes. Awareness of the ethical standards and codes is extremely important because counselling is a part of the service sector. Not following the ethical standards may have legal implications. While learning about the competencies of a counsellor, it is important for you to know that the client counsellor relationship is built on ethical practice. The American Psychological Association has developed a code of ethical conduct for behaviour and decision making in actual clinical settings. The practical knowledge of these ethical domains can guide the practice of counselling and achieving its desired purpose. Some of the APA practice guidelines are First is knowledge of ethical or professional codes, standards and guidelines, knowledge of rules, regulations and case law relevant to the practice of psychology. The next guideline is recognize and analyze ethical and legal issues across the range of professional activities in the clinical setting. The third guideline is recognize and understand the ethical dimensions and features of his or her own attitudes and practice in the clinical setting. The fourth guideline is seek appropriate information and consultation when faced with ethical issues. And the last guideline is Practice appropriate professional assertiveness related to ethical issues. In this way, we have completed chapter 9, which is developing psychological skills. And today, we have completed psychological testing skills, interviewing skills, counselling skills and ethics in counselling. I hope 
you all have understood the concepts really well thank you